Good morning. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of 1 Kings chapter 8. And if you didn't bring your Bible, there is a pew Bible in front of you, and you can turn to page 288. How about that? And uh, so if you turn to page 288, you'll be right there at 1 Kings chapter 8. We have been doing a series on King Solomon. And many of you who have been following us said, Danny, I thought we wrapped that up last Sunday. We're going to conclude this, the uh, series by looking at chapter 8 of when Solomon dedicated the temple. One of the things when you look at uh, this series, we said he was a thinker. He was wise. You know, he wrote, wrote Proverbs and had the, the greatest wisdom. He was a builder. He built the temple. He was a leader. He was a king. And when he built the temple, it talks about number of chapters about how they built it and then all of a sudden when they were getting ready to come into it Michael talked about it when they they came and they brought the Ark of the Covenant that contained the Ten Commandments and when they brought this into the uh, into the into the temple all of a sudden the glory of God filled it well then if you continue on in chapter 8 Solomon stands before the people and he gives a prayer of dedication and as he gives this prayer of dedication he is praying to the Lord, and he is asking some things of the Lord to do in that space. And so as we dedicate the worship center that we have just moved back in, I want us to follow the same model that Solomon had and take his framework and put it into where we are today and let this sort of be our groundwork. This is where we go from here. This is the purpose of this place. This is what our goal and our desire is. So if you have your Bible, we're going to cover a good bit of Scripture. But if you've got your Bible with you, we'll also put the Scriptures up on the small screens behind me. Okay? First Kings. First Kings chapter 8. Let's have a ripple effect uh, on there. So First Kings chapter 8. Solomon comes, and when he comes before all the people, it says he stands before the altar of God, and he uplifts his hands, and he begins to pray this prayer. And let me give you the framework. First point is this, praise. The Lord God is the one true God. Let's write this down because this is foundational to everything. It all started with his prayer was one of praise. The Lord God is the one true God. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 23 through 26, look what he says. And he said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart, who have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand you have fulfilled it this day. Now, therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, you shall not lack a man to sit me on, to, to, in a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. And so he says, now, O Lord, O God, of Israel let your word be confirmed which you have spoken to your servant David my father and so he starts out with a very personal plea oh Lord God of Israel our God the God of Israel a personal God of Israel uh, the God who he said is above the heavens and a, the God who is even the God beneath the earth you are the God eternal and he starts out by pointing out this personal relationship that they have with God. And they say, the praise comes to you. And he talks about the greatness of God. And he says, you are a God who is faithful. You are a God who is trustworthy. You are a God who's a promise keeper. You said this would be built, and it was built. You are a God who honors obedience because you said to my father David that you would continue to have his descendants sit on the throne, and you honor obedience because you put in that if word, if they will follow my ways, then you will continue to honor that obedience. Oh, listen, in this worship center, we praise the one true God. We praise the God whom we have a personal relationship through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John 1, 12, that as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. 
And so how do we translate that? We translate that in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus was talking to his followers and he said, let me tell you how to pray. It's what we call the Lord's Prayer. And he said, this is how I want you to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. There's a personal relationship that we have with our God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed. What does that mean? It means holy. It means reverence. Holy is your name, your character. And so we are told to do just as what Solomon said, and that is we praise a personal God. He is our Father. So as we move into this place, we praise that the Lord God is the one true God. But second is the perspective, and that is that God cannot be contained. The perspective that he gives in verse 27 is that God cannot be contained. Look what he says in verse 27. He says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. They built the temple. They had an area called the Holy of Holies. They had the Ark of the Covenant and everything was set there. And there was a place to where it was the presence of God was to sit. And he said, listen, we just got to be real straight with you. We know, God, that we can't contain you in this one little area. Because, see, your spirit fills the entire universe. So we know we can't contain you. So he kept it in perspective. You have chosen this as a place where we can come and worship you. This is where we can come into contact with you. But we do realize that we cannot contain you. You are beyond. Bottom line, don't be enamored with the beauty of the temple, but be humbled by the greatness and the holiness of God. And that is true. For our remodeled worship center our main thing that we want to be enamored with is the greatness and the holiness of God when this worship center was originally built in 1989 dr. Charles Carter uh, led the capital campaign and it was called for his glory and the purpose was was that when this worship center was built is it was built for us to be able to give praise and honor and glory to God and God's presence is here, and this is where we do business with him. As we worship him through the songs that we sing and through the prayers that we lift up, through the messages that are preached, through the offerings that are given, and through the lives that are transformed, in all of those things, we are bringing honor and praise to God. But God cannot be contained here. We are sent. You know, we don't just sit here and say, man, if we could just sit here every, uh, you know, every moment of every day and just worship God, would that be great? That's not what he wants. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus takes some of his disciples with him. They go up there, and all of a sudden, uh, Moses and Elijah come down, and they're speaking to Jesus, and all the disciples are like, whoa, this is incredible. I've never seen anything like this. And they didn't know what to say, so they just jumped up and they said, hey, tell you what we'll do. Why don't we build some little tents, and we'll just stay up here and, and live up here. This is incredible. And what did Jesus say? Nah, we're called to go down and to minister to the people. Same thing here. We're here, we come here every Sunday, we're going to have incredible times of worship. But when it's over, we're sent out. We are sent out. Now look what it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? All right. Solomon's dedicating a temple. We're dedicating a worship center. He says there's a temple that is within you, and that's where the Holy Spirit resides. Whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. And we never need to forget that. Because of our sins, we were separated from God. Because of our sins, when we die in our sins, we would spend eternity separated from him. But God, in his love and mercy, sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come here on earth, live a perfect life, voluntarily go to a cross to be the sacrifice and the payment for our sins. And as he dies on that cross, he pays the penalty for our sins. But then three days later, he is raised from the dead. And when he's raised from the dead, he's conquered sin, he's conquered death, and he's provided us a pathway to have a relationship with God. And he says, you have been bought with a price. I've been bought with a price. And when we ask Jesus Christ to come into our life, what happens is the Holy Spirit enters into our life. And it says, this is like the temple. This is where he resides. And so when we come here on Sunday mornings, we come and, and we praise God. And after we praise God, then all of a sudden we are to be sent out. 
At the end of each one of these services, we should be cleansed, forgiven, recalibrated, energized, and then sent out from this place to be able to tell people about who Jesus is and to live for Jesus. God cannot be contained here. He releases us, empowered by his Holy Spirit, to go into our spheres of influence to bring him glory. Well, he did this praise, he did perspective, and then he just gives a heartfelt plea. Look what he says in verses 28 through 30. In verse 28, uh, he says this. He says, yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God. And he says, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day. Now, just stop right there for a moment. That you're, and he talks about you have a prayer, you have a plea, you have a cry. The intensity is building. And as the intensity builds, this is what his intensity is. He says, Lord, this is what we want. Verse 29, that your eyes may be open night and day. All the time. Your eyes will be open night and day toward this house. The place, the place of which you have said that my name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. And he says, and listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place and listen in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. He says, God, what we want is a plea that God will meet us where we are. He says, Lord, we want you to meet us where we are. We want you to know our situations. We want you to hear us. We want you to see us. And we want you to do this 24-7. He said, that's my plea for you. Well, what the temple had done is it had provided them a place of contact. And so people could come to the temple and they would, they would be there with the priests and they could come and they could pray, pray to God and it gave them this great opportunity to do this. And, and what Solomon is saying is, Lord, we don't want this just to be on special days. This just needs to be continuously. You need to meet us where we are. Well, I've got great news for you. God meets us right where we are. He knows our situation. He knows us exactly. He knows what happens to us every day. He knows what's happening to us every night. He's attentively listening to your prayers. And whether you're a morning prayer person, a daytime prayer person, a 911 prayer person in the middle of the afternoon, or an evening prayer person, whatever it may be, he says he hears it and he sees it and he meets us right where we are. And that is our plea, is that God will meet us right where we are, right here in this worship Sunday. In this worship center, every Sunday as we praise his name, we ask that he will reveal himself to every one of us and that he'll speak love, he'll speak truth, conviction, peace, and encouragement into our lives. Meet us right where we are. He praises God. He puts it all in perspective. He makes this impassionate plea that God will meet us where we are. And then he gives seven petitions. He gives seven petitions, and all seven of them, they start with either if or when. That says, this is probably going to happen, and this is definitely going to happen. And when this happens, this is what I'm asking you to do, Lord. Now, I want to take that same framework. And for them, everything was centered towards the temple. You'll see in every verse, as we pray toward the temple, as we pray toward the temple, we want you to do this. I want to take those same verses and put it as when we come walking into the worship center. What we need to understand is every Sunday, you, me, and the people that will be coming every, every Sunday here, we bring our own particular life situations with us. And we come and we bring our life situations, we sit in these pews, and we worship God for an hour or a little longer. And as we're worshiping him, I have a prayer, a petition, of what we want God to do while we're in here tracks exactly what uh, Solomon was saying because he says that God will meet us right where we are. Are you ready? Here they are. Here's the first petition. That there will be conviction and reconciliation. There will be conviction and reconciliation. Look what he says in verse 31 and 32. In verse 31 he says, if a man sins against his, sins against his neighbor and he is made to take an oath and he comes and he swears his oath before your altar in this house. Then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head 
and vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. What Solomon was praying is that, hey, when people come before you, Lord, uh, I just pray that the uh, guilty are condemned, and I pray that the innocent uh, are vindicated and that righteousness would take place. What got my attention was in that verse it says, with your neighbor, with your neighbor. So if there's something that you've done to your neighbor and then you come in and you say, hey, I've, I've got to deal with this. I, I thought about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 23 through 24. And what he said is when you come to the, to the service, to the temple, and you bring your offering, that when you bring your offering, and just as you're bringing it up to the altar, and let's say if you came forward and you're getting ready to bring your offering to the altar, if while you're doing that, you are reminded that somebody has something against you. There's something that you've done wrong to that person. You know what you need to do? Leave your offering and go get it straightened out. You go get reconciled. And after you get reconciled, then you come back and for, give your offering to the Lord. There needs conviction, and there also needs to be reconciliation. This is my petition. My petition is that the Lord will convict our hearts over anyone that we have wronged, gossiped, swindled, lied about, unfairly characterized on social media, and then the Lord will motivate us to go to them and repent, ask for forgiveness, and bring reconciliation to that relationship. That's my prayer. And I'm going to make the same type of petitions, that this is what God will do when we walk into this place, and that he'll talk to us like that. Number two, rescue us from the evil one. Rescue from the evil one. Verses 33 through 34. He says, and when your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you, and if they turn again to you and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house, then hear in heaven, forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave to their fathers. After defeated by an enemy, for them, he says, you know what's going to happen? You're going to turn away from God's word, and an enemy is going to defeat you, and he's going to take you out of that land. They're going to be captive. They're going to be held, uh, they're going to deal with hardships. And he says, there will come a time when they repent. And when they repent, we ask that when they ask for forgiveness, you would forgive their sins, and you would bring them back to the land, and that you would rescue them from their captors. Rescue from the evil one. Folks, every Sunday there will be those in attendance who are Christ followers, who have been seduced by the evil one. They are living in captivity to sin, and yet they have a strong desire to be rescued. And if for some reason on that Sunday God had them to come into this church and sit in whatever pew they're sitting in, and they feel like they have been captured by the enemy. They're a believer. They know what it's like to have walked with Christ. They understand the joy of that, but they're not experiencing that anymore. They're experiencing more of the hardships, and they find themselves, feel like they're captured in enemy territory, and it just seems like that there's no hope. My prayer is that, petition is that when they come into this worship center, that God would remind them of Jesus' parable in Luke 15. And in Luke 15, he talked about the man who had 100 sheep, and he said one of them got lost, and so he had 99 and this is the man that left the 99 in the open country, and he went and he began to look for the one lost sheep. And as he went to find that one lost sheep, when he found him, he picked him up, he takes him, and you've seen pictures of some people, artists, depiction, put him around his neck, takes him back home. And when he takes him back home, he then calls a party, and everybody rejoices because the one that was lost had now been found. We want this to be a place where people are rescued from the evil one this is the same Jesus that can rescue you from your evil one this is the same Jesus that can rescue your life that can rescue your marriage that can rescue your relationships that can rescue your family that can rescue your career this same Jesus and my petition is that when people come in here that the Spirit of God moves so much that these are in captivity will be rescued. Third is the redirection in life. The redirection in life. He gives you this next group. He says when heaven is shut up and there's, um, and there's no rain because they have sinned against you. 
If they pray toward this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, when you teach them in the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon your land which you have given to your people as an inheritance. These are people who they're experiencing the consequences of sin. Well, you can take that to today. We have believers, all of us, that whenever we mess up their consequences of sin and we make we have sin due to poor choices and disregard for God's word. And what happens is that some people find their life heading in such a wrong direction and that they're miserable, they're frustrated, and they're coming to the end of their rope. And they're looking for some kind of redirection in their life. And God brings them here to a worship service at Shades Mountain Baptist Church. And when they walk in, knowing that their life is heading in this direction and they would love to have some kind of redirection, that the Spirit of God would speak to them. My petition is that when they come into this worship center that God's Spirit will reveal His love and His forgiveness and that God will redirect their life by teaching them the good way in which they should walk. If you notice that in that passage, he talked about that God would then teach them the good way in which they walk. He didn't just sit there and say, hey, we love you, brother, we forgive you. He said, let me help you. Let me equip you. Let me help you to walk that good walk. May people come in here May God's word speak to their heart. It's found in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, when he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so those who are looking for their redirection in life, looking for a life that's not to be conformed to this world but be transformed, that the Spirit of God would speak to them so strongly. They say, that's what I want to do. And then guess what will happen? He said in Solomon's, he talked about there would be rain on the land. There would be refreshing for that individual because you will know the perfect and acceptable will of God, that redirection of life. Number four is a deliverance from disaster. A deliverance from disaster now verse 37 he says if there is famine in the land if there's pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar if their enemy besieges them in the land at their gates whatever plague whatever sickness there is okay he just kind of covered a laundry list okay all kind of disasters can happen to you it could be natural disasters could be national disasters over here he says, whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man or by all your people Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart. That means the affliction of my own heart. I'm not worried about you at this time. I'm worried about me. In my own heart, this is what I'm dealing with. This is the disaster that my life is in. And so I pray to God. And he says this, of his own heart, stretching out his hands toward this house, then here in heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive and act and render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you and you only know the hearts of all the children of mankind. You can't pull a fast one on God. He knows your heart, and when you pray, he knows your spirit on there. And he says that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land that you gave to your father. He is saying, Listen, when all of this stuff comes, it's like a disaster. Some of it we've caused on our own because of poor choices we've made and we've gone against God's word. Some of it we had n nothing to do with. It's outside our control. It's just life. And sometimes life gives you some gut punches. Sometimes they throw some haymakers at you. And it could be health or it could be finances, but who knows? I mean, it's all kind of things that can happen in life. And you just get beat up and you feel like that you're living in a disaster zone. And you're wondering, is there any deliverance on here? But now both of these serve as wake-up calls for God, for us to come to him and say, Lord, I need your help. And here's my petition for our church. My petition is that when those living in a disaster, those that are dealing with the famine, the pestilence, the blight, the mildew, the locusts, the caterpillars, all these things, when they come into this worship center, my hope is that God's Spirit would impress upon them Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. And that a person whose life is in so much turmoil, in so much disaster, 
that they know this verse. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then what will happen? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That when people walk into this place, God's Spirit will be so strong on them that they're experiencing a peace that they have not experienced in a long time. And he delivers them from that disaster. And it said at the end of, that, of those verses that the whole purpose of that is so that they will fear God. They will take God seriously. They will have an awe over who he is. So can you imagine that? Somebody walks in here. Their life is a disaster. And they're really not even sure that God even hears them. That within a service to be a part of here where God's word is preached, music is sung, prayers are lifted up, you people greeting them, meeting them, pouring into their lives can walk out of this place having the peace that passes all understanding and then have a new appreciation for who God is and to fear him and to be in awe. Wow, that'd be great. Number five, reaching all people. Reaching all people. Solomon says in verses 41 through 43, he says, likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel, a foreigner, that's people who weren't born in Alabama, okay? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> likewise, when a foreigner uh, uh, who is not of your people Israel, when a Yankee who is not of your, no, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel, what well, comes from a far country for your name's sake. Now, this is pretty cool right here. They're coming from a far country for your name's sake, which means they've heard of him. They've heard of this God. And, and so they're coming for his name's sake, even, even just to, to come over here to Israel. And he says, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. All the great works that God has done. And when he comes and he prays toward this house, here in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. Reach all people. Interesting, Solomon wanted the temple to be a mission station to reach the world. Isn't that amazing? It was not just for our own little group uh, there in Israel. He wanted everyone to come, and he wanted all peoples to know. And so we want to reach all people here. This is my petition. My petition is that when unbelievers, no matter their ethnicity or social economic status, come into this worship center that God's presence will so fill this place that his love will so fill our members that unbelievers will be drawn to know God and that this place will truly honor God's name. 1 Timothy 2, 4 says he desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is his will that all people come to know Christ and for all people to know his name and to bring him honor and to bring him glory. We want to be reaching all people. Number six, victory in spiritual battles. Victory in spiritual battles. Verses 44, 45. He says, if your people go out to battle against their enemies by whatever way you shall send them, and they pray to the Lord toward the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. He says, soldiers, when they're sent into battle, they're no longer in Jerusalem. They can't come to the temple to pray. So my big ask of you, Lord, is that when they pray toward this temple, that you would hear their prayer and you would give them victory in their battles. Victory in spiritual battles. Folks, every day we are sent into spiritual warfare. Whether it's cultural clashes regarding the sanctity of life, the sanctity of marriage, or godless immoral agendas, or just living a countercultural Christ-like life. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, and the cosmic powers over against this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's spiritual warfare, and it's easily discouraged. We can easily get discouraged whenever you're in spiritual warfare. It's a battle, 
and we're battling with unseen forces my petition is that when weary spiritual soldiers come into this worship center that God would renew their strength tweak their spiritual armor and encourage them to stand strong and give them victory that means every one of us when we come into this place some of us kind of get beat up during the week and I know you're right out there on the front lines uh, on there and you're trying to make a stand for God and, and, and the things that you believe and what God's Word teaches clashes so much with what's being taught out in culture and then when you come into this place it's my prayer that God's Spirit and that God would speak to us in such a strong way that he would take the weary soldier and he would re-energize you and that he would give you the victory to fight the battles that you're gonna fight and and I and I, I, I use the, the phrase to kind of tweak your spiritual armor I, you know, in Ephesians 6, it talks about putting on that spiritual armor and you, you put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of peace and the helmet of salvation and the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. And I just think that every time we come into worship, sometimes we need to tweak it a little bit. Sometimes it doesn't fit real well. I'm not real doing really good in this area. So maybe when I come here in a worship service, God can kind of tweak that to where all of a sudden that belt feels a little bit better, that belt of truth, I understand it a little bit better. Uh, you know, that shield of faith, it's a little bit stronger. I think I'm ready to go. The sword of the Spirit's a little bit sharper. Not to be able to slice and dice somebody, but to be able to take out the, the sword, the word of, of the Lord, and to be able to hit right where that need is that that person has, and to be used by God for that. Victory in, in battle. And last of all is this, the last petition he had, and I just put it down as forgiveness, restoration, and hope. Forgiveness, restoration, and hope. Look at these verses, 46 through 53. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. Okay, folks, we're all in the same boat. You got that? We all are going to sin. And his last petition to God, it says, Father, we're all going to sin. And you are angry with them. And you give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy far off or near to where the nation turns their back so much on God that he puts them into the hands of an enemy and the enemy exiles them from their land yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captor saying we have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly if they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their enemies who carried them captive and pray to you toward their, their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. And forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions that they have committed against you. And grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. For they are your people and your heritage, which you brought out of Egypt from the midst of the iron furnace. Let your eyes be open to the plea of your servant and to the plea of your people Israel, giving ear to them whenever they call to you. For you separated them from among all the peoples of the earth to be your heritage as you declared through Moses your servant when you brought our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. Now, you take those same verses, you need to put it in context. When 1 Kings was written, the people who were reading 1 Kings were people who were living in exile in Babylon. They had been taken over by Babylon they had destroyed the temple, they destroyed Jerusalem, and they had taken the people and they had taken them to a foreign land. And as they read this verse, they're living it out. Because they say, and you get sent to a far land. Yes, that's us. We're in this, we're in this far land. And there's a hopelessness that they have. But when you look back on this prayer and they're reading this prayer that Solomon has, and what his petition of God is, is that God would hear them, would forgive them, and that he can bring them back to the land. These chosen people have got hope that they can come back to the chosen land. No matter how far from God one may go, 
once they're convicted of sin in their ways and they desire to turn their hearts, he will listen to their prayer. He will forgive them, he will restore them, and he will grant them compassion to those whom they have wronged. And here's what my petition is. My petition is that when the downtrodden and the defeated come into this worship center, that God will assure them of forgiveness, he will give them hope, and he will restore them to usefulness in his kingdom. There is never anyone who's too far away from God to where God cannot forgive them and use them again. There's no one that can come and say, well, I guess I've blown it. I just can't ever be used by God. I'm going to be real straight with you. There may be some things that you may not be able to do, but there are other things that you can do, and God has not given up on you. There are other paths that God can take you. And so I pray that it would be that type of spirit. I would pray that when people come in here, there would be that spirit of forgiveness, of restoration, and of hope that when the person that walks into this place whose life has been a disaster and they've made some horrible mistakes and they feel that they've been put on the shelf, that when they come here because of God's spirit and what he, he speaks into their heart and he gives them that assurance and that forgiveness and there's hope and there's restoration to where, yes, there is a next chapter. There is a next chapter for my life. That's what my prayer is. And so this Sunday morning, as we stand here and we've moved back into a, a remodeled worship center, a worship center that has stood here for 30 years wanting to do the exact same thing, and that is that we want to worship God and give him all the honor and the glory. And it is my petition and my prayers that God, his presence and his spirit would be so alive and vibrant in here. And that speaks really through all of us. And that as we come into this place, we'll have our eyes open for those that are hurting, put our arms around them. And that for us, that when we're hurting, that it's not an excuse for us to say, well, I guess I'll just stay home. I don't need to come. No, you need to come. This is where you need to be. But you don't know what I've done. You need to be here. You don't know what pain I've been. You need to be here. And then just let the Spirit of God begin to envelop them and wrap them around his arms. And that when they walk out of here, they said, it has been good that we have been in the house of the Lord. And we want to close this message. I want to close it the same way that Solomon closed his. There was a benediction that he had. And I want to ask all of you to stand. And as all of you stand, um, I'm going to have us all read this, okay? So this will be, the way we'll kind of wrap up the message is, a, um, is like a responsive reading of 1 Kings chapter 8, 57 through 61. And so let's read this together. He says, the Lord our God, let's see, we've got it, got it. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to him, to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his rules, which he commanded our fathers. Let these words of mine, which I have pleaded before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night. And may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day requires that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no other. Let your heart, therefore, be wholly true to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes, in keeping his commandments as at this day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, that is our prayer to you. And Lord, with all of our hearts, we pray that we would be a people that would continue to walk according to your word and according to your commandments. And also, Lord, that we would be a people that would be focused on reaching all people and that we would continue to be a light on a hill that would shine throughout this entire world to take the gospel that will bring honor and glory to your name in our desire, which is your desire, that all the peoples of the earth would bring glory to you and would honor you. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the words that we have heard, and may we be ones that realize that the temple, our bodies, have the Holy Spirit within us 
And that when we move from this place, Lord, we go as um, ambassadors for Christ, being sent to tell others this great news. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.